fiddle hand, and I was thinking it was four minutes till ten. So I thought, well, I'll wait till ten o'clock. So then I just looked at it again, and it's still four minutes till ten. <laughs> I finally realized it's 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 about twelve or thirteen minutes after eleven. It's never been set on running the clock back. Anyway, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> It's um, good to have Brother and Sister Lucas with us today. Uh, I think Brother Jake, Brother Caleb, and Sister Hannah's are they getting their house this week? Did where are they? Are you good? I think they come down maybe to help them uh, get get into their home. Uh, and then we get the benefit by having them in church with us, and we appreciate that. I know that uh, <clears throat> it just seems like there's a great big spike in this pandemic virus uh, since Thanksgiving. I guess, you know, they predicted it would happen. In fact, they said from Thanksgiving to Christmas there would be probably 30,000 deaths. And it looks like they're on track for that. So, you know, I probably will cancel service next weekend since Christmas is Friday. There's going to be so much activity uh, probably for Christmas. I mean, I, I'm i hoping everybody ought to just try to stay in, but I know it's difficult Christmas time. And, and, uh, but... It is, you know, it's a for sure thing that people are going to, more people are going to die because of traveling, being together with family and what have you during Christmas. But anyway, I probably will just be safe and and uh, shut down next Sunday. But we'll let everybody know if I'm, uh, I, I don't think I'll change on that, but uh, I just think that that's probably the safest thing to do. <laughs> Um, I know that the next weekend is is New Year's, but I don't think that's as dangerous as as uh, Christmas would be. So anyway, um, I know that these, you know, I'm hoping these vaccines actually work. You know, uh, the they approved the Moderna vaccine. I don't understand how that they got to have that Pfizer Max vaccine 70 below zero. Uh, and I don't think it can be out of that temperature for maybe just a few minute or two. You got to give it, you know, it's got to stay in that temperature. I don't know what keeps it from freezing. <laughs> I mean, there's something in it that won't freeze, evidently. Uh, I guess once it gets in your body, and your body will take it, and it'll cause you to uh, have, you know, uh, some kind of reaction that is supposed to prevent, the, hopefully prevent the disease. They are saying it probably only lasts just a few months. You got to have it within again within three weeks, I think, on the. Pfizer and the Moderna, I think, again in four weeks to have the second one. Then there's another one I can't remember. Starts with an A. Another company that is going to be looking for approval pretty soon. That you only have to have it one shot. <clears throat> How do you say that? AstraZeneca. Yeah, that sounds right. I I I, uh, uh, I heard the name, but I didn't wasn't sure I could remember exactly right. But anyway, they're supposed to have a vaccine uh, up for approval pretty quick. The Pfizer, you know, they had that one lady in Juneau, Alaska, have <coughs> reaction, uh, but they've had several more reactions since then. They've had maybe a half a dozen more. Uh, most of them have been too bad, just a racing of the heart, a little bit of shortness of the breath. Um, so, <clears throat> hope maybe some of these others before it's 
time where the general public can get get it. Maybe maybe they'll have some of them will come out that don't have any reactions. But anyway, uh, hopefully this will be the beginning of the end of the p pandemic. They're hoping by the end of the summer they they would have everything slowed way down. So I do believe that the Lord is definitely. Uh, in, I, I think God's in charge of everything. So I think He's in. He definitely is in charge of. Of, uh, I mean, God could have stopped this, but I, I. And I think we'll get through the pandemic. But I think there'll be something right behind it. I, I think that we're living in a time that uh, that uh, God's getting the world ready. For the uh, end of the Gentile world, and and I think the prophecy will come to pass, and so it has been. You can try to trace time. There's one thing about time; it just seems like God never has gave us the very depth of specifics. <clears throat> but we do know that it's been. Uh, 2,000 years, basically, since uh, the early church, since the day of Pentecost, or not, um, it's not quite there, but, and then, if you go by the change over from the uh, Jewish calendar to the Gregorian calendar, they say we've lost eight years, uh, so, <clears throat> that may have to be factored in. We don't know how the Lord looks at that. That's one of the reasons that I've always been very, uh, I've been very careful about projecting a timetable that is uh, exact, or you know, trying to exact a timetable, because we've had that. You know, Brother Souders thought the end of the uh, Gentile world was coming in the. 50s, and then after I got here, it was projected in the 80s, <clears throat> and so I don't want to I don't want to exact anything because it seems like the Lord is removing, you know. However, we do have scriptures. <clears throat> I was going to say removing any exact uh, uh, disclosure of time exact time, but it looks like the closer we get to it, Amos, wasn't it Amos that said, uh, the Lord doeth nothing that first he shows it to his prophets. <clears throat> so I think God, God's people, then there is a scripture in, uh, if you want to look at uh, second, let's see, I believe it's in First Thessalonians 5. <clears throat> Um, where Paul said this, and he's talking, of course, to the Thessalonican church, which is a Gentile church. He said, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. A lot of you know, in Christendom, a lot of people stop right there and say Jesus is coming as a thief in the night. That's not true. If you go on and read, it says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. It seems that uh, once the beast system is set up, that they'll think that they've arrived at, a, at peace, and bringing peace to the world through a, a, a world system of government, both religious and civil. But ye, brethren, verse 4 says, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light, the children of the day. We're not of the night nor in darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us 
who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet and the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. For whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Uh, so, <clears throat> he's not coming as a thief in the night, not to the church, um, not to the saints. They, 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 they will know, as being children of the day, we'll know <clears throat> and have an insight of what God's doing. And so, you know, uh, when it Hosea that said that, speaking of the Jews, after two days, <clears throat> you know, that, that the, they will recognize, the Jews will see him whom, whose hands they've pierced, side they've pierced. Uh, so that indication is, in 2,000 years, that prophetically, that God would begin to graft the the Jew back in. If you want to look at Romans, the eleventh uh, chapter of Romans, um, let's read just a little bit of what Paul's saying here. <clears throat> he said, "I say then, verse first verse, hath God cast away His people?" God forbid, for I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not that the scripture saith of Elias that I mean how to make how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the the answer of God unto him. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to the knee of the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then is no more works, no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, otherwise, work is no more work. Of course, what Paul's doing here is he's teaching that <clears throat> of the new covenant that they're no longer under the law and how that the, the Jews are having so much difficulty accepting that and, and they look to the law for so long. Um, and many of them rejected, you know, the Lord. There's only a remnant in that early church that didn't reject him. But he goes on here in the seventh verse, said, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Now that's not to say that God made them blind. It it is because of their because of their uh, hearts, which really is talking about their minds that that they are so they were so fixed on the law that they wouldn't accept anything different than the law of Moses. They, they were having trouble seeing how Christ could come uh, in so much that they put the law above all of the witness of, of the presence of God, the anointing of God, the miracles, all the signs that God gave to show that Jesus was his son. You know, Jesus did say that. He said, I, there is another that bears witness of me. He said, I'm not alone. There's another that bears witness of me. And, and he gave such an anointing, and he, he backed the Lord up in so many ways and miracles and signs that 
but they still denied all of that. That, they, that had no effect. Uh, sometimes I think like this. I think in the restored church, in fact, I'm, I feel fairly certain about it, that in the restored church there will be many people that will reject, reject it because it, it's probably going to be different than what we imagine it to be, where our minds are set. I, you know, I've really prayed, God, don't let me miss it. If, if I'm here when the church is restored, I don't want to miss it. I want to be tender enough to the Spirit of God, and that's, and that, that's the key, I believe. If you'll, stay, if you'll stay close to the Spirit, if you'll desire the Spirit, and, and uh, you know, make sure that you don't get so fixed in your heart that the Spirit of God is not... Uh, that your heart's not tender towards the Spirit of God, that God could deal with you. And so, <clears throat> uh, anyway, I don't feel, it's, it, the Lord, it, he, in other words, He won't force them to see. In other words, if, if they have a heart that won't see, then that's fixed, that He's not going to force that upon anybody. Verse 9 said, And David saith, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and recompense unto them that their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. I say then, Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation is coming to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. I would have to say that God knew. He knew Israel's condition. He knew there would only be a remnant. Um, there will only be a remnant out of this harvest in, in the end of the Gentile world that's going to be uh, saved. Uh, you know, I think there will be, uh, in the resurrection of the just and the unjust, there will be far more unjust of God's children that will come up in the resurrection. And uh, did I make all them people mad? Anyway, I'm just kidding. They're, I know they're going to practice. Uh, uh, so uh, I know that <clears throat> there was just a remnant back there. There's just there'll just be a remnant down here. That's disappointing, I know, to a certain extent. But of course. A remnant can be a large number compared to the whole, but still just a remnant. It's far, it's far less than the majority, for sure. Um, and the Lord knew that, that the salvation that came to the Gentiles would eventually provoke the Jews to jealousy. Let's read on a little bit. Now if they fall, verse 12, now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward, they, toward thee goodness, if thou continue, if 
thou continue in goodness. Otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is by, wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature, into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, being, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. So <clears throat> it is a mystery to realize that uh, those those natural branches, are, which was he's speaking of here, being Israel, because of their unbelief and rejecting of Christ, uh, back there in the early church, they were more or less broken, all, broken branches that could not remain uh, a part of the tree or the part of the body of Christ. But they are God's children. And though they're unjust, uh, that nation, uh, even today, and there's where the parable of the rich man and Lazarus comes in, where you remember Jesus telling that, that parable that the rich man died and went to hell, and the Lazarus died and went to the bo bo bosom of Abraham. Uh, he didn't, you know, when you read that, you... You ought to, people ought to get some indication out of that that this that Lazarus didn't crawl up in the bosom of Abraham. Abraham's dead in the grave. It just means that he 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 entered the covenant that God made with Abraham, and <clears throat> that's the Gentile. Lazarus represented the Gentile, and the rich man represented the Jew, and. Um, the Jew went into a hellish condition, and they've been in that condition ever since. Uh, John stated clearly in 1 John that he that believeth not that Jesus uh, came in the flesh, that the Son of God came in the flesh, which they didn't believe he was the Son of God. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. He said, they are the Antichrist. That's an Antichrist group of people. They're against Christ being the Messiah. That was way back there in their day that the Antichrist existed back there. And down here, of course, they didn't just reject the, the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. They rejected the body of Christ as being his people, as being an uh, a new covenant of grace, they rejected that. And in doing so, they rejected Christ. <clears throat> uh, that actually is the, uh, the statement where Jesus said, you could speak against God, you could speak against Christ, but if you, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, See, the Spirit of God was working in, that, in the end of that world during the harvest of that world. And um, if you rejected that move of God for that 40, 45-year period, and you rejected that, there wasn't anything God could show you. If you rejected everything those apostles and the apostle Paul did and all the miracles and signs and truths that were brought out with the anointing of God, and you rejected that, there, there wouldn't be anything God could give you, even in a resurrection, to change your heart. Um, so, <clears throat> and, that's, and I do believe those people that rejected and blasphemed the Holy Ghost, there was no forgiveness for that. And, you know, as long as 
you rejected it, there's no forgiveness. If you changed and repented, then you could get forgiven of it and enter into the grace of God. But, but if you died in that rejection, I don't think there's anything. I think that's eternal judgment was in the end of that world. We'll have that same kind of judgment down here in the end of this world. Uh, if a person rejects the restored church and the move of God that's going to take place in the end of this world, I don't, I don't know, I don't see that there's any resurrection for them. But I think all, all of, uh, and what's took place in um, the among the Jews, they're still an antichrist group of people, even though they're God's people. <laughs> but they're against Christ being the Messiah. They, they just haven't had their eyes open to that. But Paul so shows that there's a mystery here that God in the end of this world that this message and this restored church in the end of the Gentile world will provoke a measure of those Jews all that will receive it God will save them and he'll he will graft them back in in fact that's God's wisdom that God made way back there He's held the Jew where they're at for this cause. Because in the end of this world, when God makes up his bride, and after the battle of Armageddon, there's not a people on the face of the earth that could keep the church from falling again. There's not a people that God wouldn't have to start all over with the same way he started all over with the Gentiles. But God's held the Jew in the law of Moses, in the prophets and in the history of Israel, uh, they know everything, just like the Apostle Paul knew. When God dealt with him on the road to Damascus, and when God blinded him, showed him how blind spiritually he was, and God touched him um, and caused him to see spiritually that Christ was the Messiah, those Old Testament scriptures exploded in Paul's mind, and he saw it. And he, he preached Jesus Christ right out of the Old Testament. All through his epistles, he's quoting the Old Testament, showing that Jesus was the Messiah, and showing the plan of God. And, you know, he's saying, I, if there's any way I could win my own countrymen, you know, even in the book of Romans, he said, I could almost wish myself to be cursed for their sakes, if they could, they could be saved. Uh, he had a love for the Jewish people. He grew up uh, and was trained under uh, the hand of Gamaliel, and, and he knew what their thoughts and belief was for God. They just couldn't accept Christ. They expected something totally different than what came about. And there again, there was just this remnant that saw it. But he later saw, when he wrote, uh, I don't know when he saw it, but he later wrote here to, the, to these Romans and told them, he said, God, there's a mystery here that God is going to add them back in. There, there's a, a type, you know, most of y'all have all heard me talk on it, where... Elijah, the type of Elijah. You need to get this. Elijah was, he is a, he's a type of the early rain church ministry that came all the way down through the dark ages to even today. We are still in the type of Elijah. And that type, <clears throat> there's the, the, the story that you read about in, in Kings, uh, in First and Second Kings about Elijah and, and Elisha is a beautiful picture and a beautiful type that shows this, what's going to happen. It, it's a type that shows this very thing that I'm talking about, how that Elijah, uh, if you remember, he prophesied that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. And... Uh, James, he didn't say how long it would be, I don't think, in 1 Kings, but, it, but James states it. 
that was three and a half years. That must have been somewhere in their history. And uh, so uh, in that three and a half years does link up to prophetical three and a half or 42 months or 1,260 years of the church falling away. And, of course, <clears throat> when he went, uh, finally when the famine was uh, over, or, you know, it was, it was nearing being over. Uh, he went to find Ahab, and, uh, and uh, but, but if you remember, here, here's what took place. He went, I'll have to try to remember all this in my mind, because I didn't get up here, I didn't, I didn't have no idea I was even going to talk on this today, but, uh, but he first went to a little brook called Cherith. And that, in that little brook, he stayed there, and the ravens fed him until the brook dried up. And then the Lord spoke to him and told him to go to Seraphath, which was a Gentile town, to a little widow's house. Well, <clears throat> that, the ravens that fed him there is a picture. This is a picture of the dark ages of this, this, uh, 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 the, the dearth. Uh, the famine that took pay, took place, and uh, that's a picture of of a, a minute. Ravens are are unclean animals, unclean birds, and that's a picture of of the Gentiles, you know, having just enough of the Word of God to keep you alive during the during the dark ages. That's that's all that kept they were able to keep alive with just what little. Uh, food that they had to sustain them spiritually. And then he got up and went to this little widow's house uh, at Seraphath. She had a son, but her husband had died. That's a picture. The church had fallen away. The, the ministry had, had, had departed. And it, they were it, the Gentiles. It was a time of the Gentiles in the Dark Ages. And uh, her son... If you remember her son, uh, well, was it first that uh, she just, he asked her when he saw her, he, he said, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm picking up some sticks. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a little uh, fire, and I'm gonna, I've got just a little bit of oil and a little bit of meal left. I'm going to make a cake for me and my son, and we're going to eat it and die. He said, well, make me one first, and, and then your oil if you'll make me this cake first, your oil and your uh, meal barrel will never go dry. And so she did. She made it for him. That's a picture of the people down through the dark ages that had enough faith to put God first among everything else in their lives. They didn't have much. They didn't have much, much spiritual food, but they had faith. They had, they, their faith was in God, and they put him above their own desires and their own think, thinking, and <clears throat> uh, and and when she did that, every time she went to make, every time she went to get a little meal, a little bit of oil, there was enough there to make another cake, make them another meal, and uh, of course they're just living on bre bread, <laughs> you know. But that just shows you how little of the word of God was available during the dark ages. And then her son died. See, that's a picture of the church, the Gentile church. And she produced, that church produced a little ministry, but uh, it didn't have much hardly any life in it or anointing in it. And it finally lost its anointing. And, <clears throat> uh, and uh, she went to Elijah and said, what, what are you doing to me? You know, I, you, my son's died. I have gave you everything. And, Anyway, so he, he stretched himself. He took that son upstairs uh, in a loft and, and stretched himself on that son. And uh, I'm trying to remember, is this the time where he, he uh, one of you brethren look it up, if it's the time where he put his hands on his hands, mouth on his mouth. I can't remember if that's when it, there's two stories like this. One is under Elisha and the other is under Elijah, and I don't want to get it wrong. But anyway, the, the bottom line is, is he, uh, he, 
he resurrected that child from the dead. And uh, uh, so, and, and gave it back to its mama. And, and I'm sure there were many times during the dark ages that there was just almost no ministry. It lost it. It's everything. But there was just enough of help from God and what ministry God did have to keep it alive, to keep men of faith down through those dark ages. Well, uh, finally, uh, when the, this famine was about over, he went and found Ahab and told him to meet him at, at uh, uh, Mount Carmel. And uh, he told him that the, 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 the drought was about over and he wanted to meet him there and he wanted to, to see, he wanted Israel to know who the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. And so he said to meet him there with the prophets of Baal and the prophets of, of uh, Asherah. There were 350 prophets that met him there. You know, he, he, um, uh, he went to Mount Carmel. That's a picture of, of the Reformation. I think it's a picture, of, really, of Martin Luther's, the best picture that we have of it, where, if you remember, he went there on, on Mount Carmel, and, and uh, he, had, he had their prophets go first and to build an altar and offer a sacrifice on it. He said, Whoever God, whatever God accepts as sacrifice, we'll know it's the God of, uh, God of Israel. And, of course, they did everything to try to get God to accept their sacrifice, but nothing happened. They cut themselves and, and yelled and screamed. In fact, one time he told them, he said, you need to yell a little louder. He may be asleep. <laughs> and uh, he kind of provoked them a little bit. But then finally when they got done, well, he, he had them dig a trench around the altar and pour it full of water and then pour water on top of the sacrifice. He wanted to make sure they understood that when God accepted this sacrifice, that it there was nothing that could prevent him from accepting it with fire. And, of course, he knew the time of the evening sacrifice. And at the time of the evening sacrifice, that's when he offered it up. God accepted a morning and an evening sacrifice, and he offered it up at the time of the evening sacrifice. And... God accepted that, and that's a picture of the Reformers and God accepting these Reformers standing against the Catholic Church and uh, God showing himself uh, to begin the restoration of the church. And if you remember, he went back, you know, if you remember, he went they, up on top uh, of the mountain and he told his servant, <clears throat> he said, go look out over the sea for me. And he went to look out over the sea, and he said, he come back, and he said, what did you see? He said, I didn't see nothing. He said, do it again. And he sent him seven times. The seventh time he come back, and he said, what did you see? He said, I saw a little cloud, like a man's hand. And, of course, we've always taught that's, that's the ministry that God was beginning to restore apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in a hand in that cloud showing it was going to rain again. The Spirit of God was going to reign on this earth. The, the famine was over, and God was going to begin to bless his people. And, and so uh, there on Mount Carmel, he slew and killed 350 prophets. Before he took off and run, he, before he left, Jezebel come out, and she, she told him, I'm going to kill you is just like my prophets are dead, you're going to be dead. I'm going to see to it. And the Bible said he took off running. He wasn't afraid of 350 prophets, but he was afraid of that woman. <laughs> I don't know. You don't get out of that what you want. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, you don't want to mess with a mad woman. I guess what that means. <clears throat> but that's a picture of the Catholic Church that put out a death warrant against Martin Luther and other reformers that they martyred. Uh, and uh, so finally, uh, uh, he, when he took off to run, he, he 
he stopped under a little juniper tree. A juniper tree is an evergreen. He stopped and went to sleep. And that's the only place those reformers back there could find any rest. That juniper tree is a picture of the Word of God. It's an evergreen. It always has life. And uh, he went to sleep and rested. And an angel woke him up and said, and when he woke up, there was a, a cruise of water and a, loaf, a little loaf of bread. He said, eat and drink. And he did. And then he went back to sleep. <laughs> and then, you know, this, all, some of this always has amazed me because I've always thought if I ever went to sleep out in a, you know, out in a strange place under a tree or something, and an angel woke me up and fed me something, and I was hungry and there wasn't nothing to eat, I'd probably have a hard time going back to sleep. But anyway, he went back to sleep. <laughs> Maybe the Lord put him to sleep. But it's a picture. He, he went back to sleep, and the angel woke him up again and said, eat and drink. And there was another cruise of water and another loaf of bread. And so he ate it. He said, the angel said, you're going to need it for your journey. He went on his journey, and uh, he was told uh, when, he, when he got to Mount Horeb, he was told to go to Mount Horeb. He went to Mount Horeb. And he went up in the top of the mountain, and there was a cave there, and he went inside the cave. And uh, after he got in the cave, wind began to blow against the mountain, and it blew so hard that it busted rocks against the mountain. And then there was an earthquake. The earthquake shook the mountain. Each time it said God wasn't in the wind. God wasn't in the earthquake. Then there was a fire said God wasn't in the fire but then there was a little small still voice and when Elijah heard that he wrapped himself in his cloak walked to the mouth of the cave and said here am I Lord and the Lord spoke to him and he said I want you to anoint Hazel king over Syria I want you to anoint Jehu king over Israel and I want you to anoint Elisha to take your office God, in my opinion, God was definitely in the wind, the, the earthquake, and the fire, but not for Elijah. That, to me, is a picture of the body of Christ, that cave. And in the end of the world, in this uh, picture of Elijah, in the end of the world, there will there is going to be a, in fact, already is, the wind is blowing the winds of doctrine, the winds of military winds, the wind, the social winds, the, the financial winds, the civil winds are all blowing and they're breaking up everything in government around the world and, and in religion and an earthquake. Of course, I make that earthquake the fall of America. I'll make it more than one place. There's two other places in the Revelations that I make that. But uh, then uh, the fire is judgment. God will end this thing It'll, in judgment. And uh, God gave Elijah uh, the words for the remainder of the Gentile world. And when he went down off of the mountain, he saw a young man plowing with 12 yokes of oxen, which was Elisha. And his mantle touched that boy. Evidently, they got, he must have said something to him or something. And his mantle touched him. And when it did, uh, Elisha ran and, and said, i got to follow you. And he said, what do I do to you? He said, i, I got to follow you. Let me go tell my mom and daddy goodbye. This is a picture of the Jews, the rich man, and Lazarus' parable. He the Jew, when this mantle of this ministry, the Elijah ministry, touches the Jews down in the end of this world, when God grafts them back in, they will kiss Judaism goodbye. They'll kiss their mom and daddy goodbye. They'll quit plying with the 12 tribes of Israel. They will follow Elijah. And, of course, the bottom of the line is I'm running out of time. So 
the bottom of the line is, is he followed him all the way to cross Jordan. And of course, Elijah slapped Jordan. It rolled back on his banks. And when they went across, he said, son, what do you want me to do for you? He said, I want a double portion of what you got. And he said, well, you've asked for a hard thing. But if you see me when I'm caught up, you'll have it. And he went across. As they went across and they began to reach the other side, a fiery chariot ran right at both of them and separated them. They had to separate to keep from get, keep from getting run over by this fiery chariot of horses. And right at that moment, Elijah was caught up, and Elisha saw it. He wasn't distracted by the chariot of horses or the calamity that's going to take place in the end of this world. And he saw, and what that's a picture of is that the Jews will be grafted back in. That's one of the things y'all can watch. When full-blood Jews start entering this body and get, a, get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and, and get a vision of this body, and this mantle touches them, and they leave Judaism to be a part of this, you'll know the end is soon. The end is going to take place fairly soon because... Uh, and they're going to see what causes the bride to be caught up. But they won't be here long enough that very many of them will make the bride. But God will use that Jewish ministry. As I said, there's, that's the only group of people that God can touch their minds and they'll see this, it'll explode in their minds, and they'll be able to hold this in a second heaven condition with the help of the bride and Jesus down through the thousand years to hold the church in a place where eternal judgment's taking place and people are inheriting everlasting life. And so it's a beautiful picture. I, I got a question that's coming up from some of the Spanish speaking folks, you know, Dominican Republic and some in Mexico. I want to know about the story where Elisha meets a woman whose husband died and she's got two sons and she's wanting. You know, they're, they're going to come get his, their, her two sons and make bond men out of them to pay her husband's debt because he died without paying it. And Elisha said, go borrow all the vessels you can borrow and, and uh, take the, the little bit of uh, oil that you have and begin to pour it in those vessels. And she borrowed all these vessels and she just kept pouring, kept pouring, and every one of them filled up till she was out of vessels. And she still had oil. And they won't know what that means. Do you have a question? In uh, Matthew twenty sixteen, mm -hmm. talking about the uh, the man that hired the workers, some came in early, some came in late. Um, that particular verse said, "So shall the first be last. So shall the last be. So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last." For many be called, but few chosen. Is that talking about the Jewish nation being grafted in? I think his, his real, um, the real interpretation of his intention, what he's saying there was, is that all through the Jewish world, you know, all those people came in, they were all part of God's kingdom, but right in the end of the Jewish world, those that were last first entered into the kingdom of heaven through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And uh, then others, you know, others begin to be grafted in. But, but yes, you can apply it all the way down here where we're last as Gentiles and the Jews uh, will, will be grafted back in. They were first and they're going to wind up being last. But in, um, uh, I, uh, the statement where even in the 11th hour, those that come in, they're going to still get uh, the same penny uh, in that statement. So, yeah, I, I definitely believe you could use that. Anyway, I know we're running out of time, but um, I just, I, a matter of fact, I don't remember how I got on this, but it, anyway, there it is. <laughs> God bless your hearts. We'll take a break and have church upstairs at 1130. Pray for Brother Durham. He had surgery Friday, and, and it, he's doing good, but he's still having a little bit too much complications to get here today. But 
He wanted to come, but anyway, keep him in your prayers. And Brother McNabb is home, and if God doesn't touch him, of course, he's not going to live very long, but but uh, he wanted to be home with his wife, you know, since it wasn't going to do much for him at the hospital. 